Hello, everyone, and welcome to episode 59 of the Ask Historians podcast. So uh, we're coming out uh, a day late today because we wanted to basically uh, skip over the, the madness and insanity of April Fool's. Maybe we'll do something for April Fool's in the future, but uh, not this year. So this episode is just coming to you straight as it is. No tricks or trickeries or chicanery or whatever. And I know even as I say that, some of you are going to be looking even more intently, but I promise you there's no April Fool's year. We just we just, we took a day off because uh, Ask Historians has been <laughs> doing our usual craziness on a, on a April Fool's Day. So today's a great episode. Uh, we will be talking to Souser about uh, the end, the decline and fall of, of British uh, Caribbean slavery, which is a very interesting topic that I, I think most people kind of, is one of those topics that, that we love here on the Ask Historian podcast because it gets, tends to get uh, glossed over in the history books. We'll talk about uh, the ideas about these huge, massive, tremendous death rates. Uh, we'll talk about the role of the Irish as is indentured servants. Uh, just a little bit about that. Uh, we'll talk about uh, a lot about British legislation and a lot about kind of a British political culture and uh, the rise of the abolition movement there, uh, which is an interesting take on it, looking at how the, uh, the the politics of the home country kind of extended out policies into the the, the colonies, even if they were not exactly always uh, the most perfectly executed policies, as we'll see. So we'll talk about um, some of the stuttering steps that uh, Caribbean took towards full emancipation before finally getting there and talk a little bit about the, the legacy of slavery in this area. So I, I hope you'll enjoy it. That's a wonderful episode uh, with a very plummy accent to go along with it that kind of takes the edge off. So uh, enjoy. Oh, and in our outro, we'll talk about the book raffle that we're going to start doing once we hit our next uh, Patreon funding goal. So we'll talk about that in the after the episode. So enjoy the episode. <laughs> Welcome to the Ask Historians podcast. Hello, and welcome to another episode of the Ask Historians podcast. Today, I am here with Souser, and we are going to be talking about the British Caribbean slave system, specifically its abolition, or at least its decline and fall, I guess you could say, in a very imperial Roman sense. So, uh, Souser, before we get started, why don't you go ahead and give us an idea about you know, what got you interested in this and what's your background and kind of, you know, what, what it drew you to this topic? Uh, well, I, I'd love to say that I have a really grand and exciting story, but the truth is I don't. I think like a lot of people, I kind of fell into a specialty at undergraduate level. All of the modules I happened to take my first year were all quite American slavery related and it sort of sparked a, a really passionate interest. And I, I've always had an interest in kind of human rights issues and liberation politics and stuff like that. And my undergraduate dissertation actually wasn't on slavery. It was actually on um, unfree labor in South Africa during apartheid. Um, but I, I developed a fascination through the various stuff I did at undergrad with this intersection of race and class and how people have been put to work for their race over the years in various horrible and forced ways. So no, no grand um, plan was ever in motion. I just kind of fell into a specialty. So you weren't on vacation to Bermuda and, you know, a, a ray of light hit and... I, I wish at some point in this story I was on vacation in Bermuda. That has never happened. Uh, that would be lovely. No, more like vacation in Blackpool. Uh, <laughs> which is a slightly different part of the British Empire. So uh, let's, uh, speaking of terrible parts of the British Empire, let's talk about the British Caribbean during slavery. Yeah. Uh, great segue there, I know. Uh, you know, a lot of the, the listeners and readers of Ask Historian uh, come from America, and so they're you know, fairly familiar, I guess you would say, with that system. Give us an idea of what the British slave system was in the Caribbean, and, and kind of, I guess, just to keep the touch point there, you know, how it kind of differed from the American system. Well, the British slave system of the Caribbean begins at the same time and probably slightly before the slave system in the United States. A lot of the kind of very early principles and ideas that underpin what becomes American slavery in the United States have their origins in earlier practices in the British Caribbean. So when the North American continent is mainly a British colony, they're really part of one big system with what becomes the British West Indies. As time goes on, they start to diverge, particularly in the 18th century, and the United States well, the future United States sort of sheds its reliance on the transatlantic slave trade in a way that the British West Indies never does. So the British West Indies has many more slaves from Africa 
They're working in much more intense conditions in the sugar industry in most colonies compared to the early pre-colonial United States, where it's much less intense until the advent of cotton in the South. So they they generally are conceptualized as being one system before about the mid 18th century. And then from around about then, they start to split into two very different systems and start evolving into very different ways, but with a lot of similarities from that common origin. Yeah, and you had mentioned sugar, which is, of course, the, the main crop that I think, you know, is the cash crop of the Caribbean and something that we didn't see in the uh, continental United States. But, I mean, we also see things like uh, coffee as well, right? Yep, coffee as well. Coffee is a big one, especially in the early period. Coffee and tobacco are two of the big ones. Um, and they often predate sugar. Sugar tends to... The history of sugar is a bit uneven. Um, some colonies get involved with it really early and then end up abandoning it broader Caribbean, that tends to happen, that happens to uh, what became uh, the Dominican Republic and the Spanish Caribbean. Um, but most of them start off with coffee and tobacco and then later segue into sugar, either quickly or slowly, depending on the specific colony. Yeah, I guess we, simply because sugar was so much more profitable than everything else. Yeah, exactly. It's profitable. It's quite straightforward in a lot of ways to harvest. And it's very suited to slave labor in the sense that it's a really, really intense crop because you not only have to farm it, you also have to process it and you have to farm huge quantities of it. So it was seen as quite well suited for slave exploitation as a, as a kind of crop to grow, more so than tobacco or coffee. And it's easier to make a higher quality product in many ways. Yeah. And be, because of this, because you, know, you mentioned that it's uh, it requires a great deal of backbreaking labor. The, the British colonies in the Caribbean, I mean, even though they're just, you know, we think of them as just some islands today and some of them are, you know, pretty small. But as a whole, it absorbed many, like, you know, many more uh, slaves from Africa than the actual continental United States. Uh, absolutely. The continental United States in the entire history of the transatlantic slave trade takes about half a million people from Africa. Um, Jamaica alone takes somewhere between it's either 1.1 or 1.5 million I'm not completely sure off the top of my head um, but you know more tw two to three times as many people just to one colony in the Caribbean and you know Barbados, Trinidad, similar figures there, M millions more people go to the British Caribbean via the slave trade than they do to the continental United States Yeah and I, I want to loop back around to this you know the sheer staggering number of people that were, were shipped to the Caribbean but I, I think I want to ask, also ask because, you know, you'd mentioned Jamaica, um, which is, of course, a fairly large island. But, you know, we also hear about like Barbados or like St. Kitts. And we mentioned like Bermuda earlier. Like how cohesive was the system in the Caribbean? You know, do we see commonality between these various different islands or do we see kind of each island being kind of a nation unto itself? Well, this is one of the weird issues and challenges of British Caribbean historiography, because the source material that's available to us is mainly concentrated in Trinidad and Jamaica and Barbados. But the British Caribbean includes a lot of small islands, like you mentioned St. Kitts, there's Montserrat, there's Bermuda, the Bahamas, the Virgin Islands. These places don't leave as much material behind. So a lot of what we talk about in the British Caribbean is generalised from what we know about places like Jamaica and Barbados. And there are definitely massive similarities between them, but... It's, you know, it's a weird one in that every colony is completely unique in some way and it is hard to generalise neatly from one to the other. So Barbados and Jamaica are very different in many ways and very similar in other ways. So it really, it depends on what you're looking at in each colony, what will be different and what will be similar. Well, I suppose the reason I ask that is to come back around to what I think a lot of people, the, the notion that they have of this uh, Caribbean slavery is that it was essentially just kind of a, a, a grist mill of, of running, you know, bringing slaves over from Africa, working them to death and then replacing them. Just this place where the average life expectancy was, you know, shockingly short. The work was incredibly dangerous and uh, essentially it was just this feeding of human bodies into this system yeah i mean there's there's an element of truth to that certainly i mean as we've said that many many more people are going to the british caribbean out of africa every year to the history of slave trade than ever go to the continental continent um but the the death cap narrative is based basically on a, a misrepresentation of what actually happens in the british caribbean and in the caribbean at large Sugar, in terms of its intensity, 
is not really meaningfully different in how dangerous it is and how harmful it is than, say, cotton came to be in the lower south. And the discrepancies in reproductive patterns, in death rates, in birth rates, more or less align with what you see in the discrepancies between the upper south and the lower south in the later period of the 19th century in US slavery. The big problem the British Caribbean really has that tends to skew the overall figures is that in most of the colonies, the planters were importing many more men than they were importing women, which severely reduces the capacity of the African slave population to reproduce itself. That is combined with a greater tendency for workers imported from Africa to die and a greater likelihood of children dying in infancy as a result of their parents essentially having to abandon them very quickly and go back to very intense farming and not be able to look after them. If you survived past infancy and if you were born in the British Caribbean, you had a very, very good chance of going on to live a, I'm not going to say happy and healthy life, you were a slave, but you would survive to adulthood more often than not. You would have a life not that dissimilar to a slave in the United States in many ways. So it's a, it's a very inaccurate myth that is based on a superficial reading of the overall demographic figures in the British Caribbean. But when you get into the nuance of them, you see that actually it's not really the case. It's not like people are being beaten to death every other day in the fields because, you know, if your workers were dying that often, you just couldn't run a plantation. There are, there are limitations to how much you can exhaust your labour force, even in slavery. Now, to go back to the idea about variation in between, you know, variation and commonality between these various uh, islands and plantations, and, you know, taking into account that our, our records are kind of biased towards certain areas, I mean, do we see a variation in between, um, I guess, even, you know, we, we will say, that, of course, you know, it's not, it wasn't as horrible as it's sometimes made out to be, but do we see variations in places that are incredibly horrible to be a, a slave in the Caribbean versus places that are, again, not great, but relatively better? Yes, we do. It, it varies within colony, and there's a very good study of Jamaican demographics, which has shown that within different plantations within Jamaica alone, uh, the death rate and the birth rate between individual plantations engaged in the same kind of agricultural activity can differ quite significantly. So planter choice and how much they invest and choose to look after their slaves has a role to play in determining what kind of experience an enslaved person would have in the British Caribbean. And we see between colonies Significant differences, for example, in Barbados, we see that although the farming there is very intense and Barbados has a reputation for being an especially horrid place to be a slave, by the end of the period, the Barbadian slave population is actually self-reproducing. And a big factor in that is Barbados planters made a bigger point of trying to achieve gender parity when they were importing slaves from Africa with the goal of promoting the reproduction of the slave population organically, and they do succeed in that despite the horrific conditions. So there are variations, but yeah, it's still quite a broad pattern that's the same across colonies, and the bigger determinant is probably what kind of plantation you work on. Was it growing mainly sugar, or was it also growing coffee and tobacco and so on? And that's where you see the difference, especially in Jamaica. Um, coffee plantations, tobacco plantations much better conditions of slaves and sugar ones. Now, just one final comparison to the, the looming uh, continental United States above the Caribbean. You know, in one sense, there were essentially, you know, slave colonies in the United States. You know, specifically if you look like South Carolina was essentially, it's only until the 20th century that uh, the white population finally outpaced the, the black population there. And for a long time, it really was, it was a giant plantation system. Um, yeah. But, you know, of course, there are other colonies in the continental United States that were set up to be colonies of people where slavery was kind of incidental, I guess you could say, um, particularly as we think up north where we can go. As every American high school student will know, you know, up north, the uh, the environment was not conducive to large scale slave plantations, et cetera, et cetera. But, you know, yeah. they were there to start a, a colony uh, of self-sufficient new society of people. You know, is it fair to, to look at the Caribbean and say that that wasn't the intention there, but the intention of the Caribbean was pretty much solely to make money and not to kind of 
permanently settle it as an extension of England. It's interesting because they're not necessarily mutually exclusive forms of colonization. Um, one of England's earliest colonies, Providence Island, quite unique in that it, it turns to using slave labor very, very early in its history. But it does so as a kind of almost like an early state building exercise, basically having a, a big slave workforce as a way to build a, a future for themselves in the Caribbean. And it's not just about making a lot of money to go back to England. But in general... Caribbean colonization is very much about economic exploitation, taking advantage of this fertile and distant land where you can grow these fantastic crops for export back to the empire. And there are very, very few colonies where there is actually a demographically significant white presence. And as the period goes on, the, the white presence diminishes and diminishes in most colonies. The only colony that has a long-term, sustainably high white population, really, is probably um, Bermuda, where you get a very, very substantial, I think about a third of the population is white and stays white in the long run. Um, but generally, these are very much slave colonies. And about half of the planters, when slavery was finally abolished in 1838, were actually living in Britain at the time of abolition. So we see a lot of people who go out to Jamaica or Barbados to make their fortune with their land. Maybe they stay there for 10 years, five years, and then they come back, leave their plantation in the hands of an overseer, and they manage it as a distant economic endeavor. They're not there to colonize a new world. Well, you'd mentioned abolition, so let's start ourselves down that road. Now, uh, we're going to mostly talking about the, the time period post-1807, uh, so why don't you go ahead and explain why that date is significant? Well, uh, I think a lot of uh, our listeners in the United States will recognize, I hope, the date 1807, because it's the date when the United States abolishes the slave trade, but so does Britain. In 1807, the British Parliament passes legislation in which they declare that the slave trade is now prohibited, it is illegal to buy slaves, to sell slaves, to take them from Africa, to bring them into the New World. And that is a, is a process that happens not wholly independently of what's happened in the United States at the same time, but is, is motivated by very, very different factors. So, I mean, what, what was the driving force in, uh, in, in, the, in the British Parliament to pass this then? Well, we see with the 1807 legislation, it's really the consequence of a very, very driven campaign by essentially the, the British public and the British electorate of the day. Um, with some parliamentary leadership to try and abolish the slave trade as a means to abolishing slavery, ultimately. They had this grand campaign that involved fantastic things like, you know, selling merchandise and publishing books, and you could buy badges that said you were anti-slave, and they organised sugar boycotts, you know, first major consumer boycott. And a lot of this is, is driven by religious opposition, to the slave trade coming from people like uh, Quakers and quite a few Catholics, but mainly uh, Methodists as well. And it's it's really that kind of pressure that serves to bring around a block of members of Parliament who are willing to kind of compromise on economic interests and moral interests. And for the abolitionists, the belief is if we abolish the slave trade, then because of the horrific conditions in the Caribbean, slavery will die out of its own accord and we won't have to worry about it anymore. That, of course, doesn't actually happen. But that was really the ambition of the abolitionists. In Parliament as well, uh, it's worth pointing out that um, there had obviously been war with France, where the slave trade was a major factor in the late 18th century. That helped to turn people against the idea of the slave trade. And also, um, the Act of Union had brought in many more Irish nationalist MPs who were generally opposition in opposition to slavery. So if we can make a very brief digression here, you mentioned Ireland, and I just want to get this this clear that because a lot of people say that, oh, you know, well, the Irish would, of course, be opposed to this because the Irish were slaves, too, in the Caribbean. Well, um, no, that's that's not what Irish opposition to the slave trade is about at all. The Irish were not slaves in the Caribbean. There were plenty of Irish indentured servants but historians do not see indentured servitude as a form of slavery. It is a qualitatively different system in how it's constructed, in how it's rationalised, in how it's carried out. 
and in the protections given to the servants, which, although they very often existed largely only on paper, they did exist and they did provide some measure of amelioration and protection for quite a few people. And it's also worth pointing out that this, this very strange Irish slavery myth is based largely on one incident where Irish people are particularly targeted for political reasons, not for ethnic reasons, because a group of Irish people who, who opposed unification with the UK is seen as being harmful to imperial security and get sent out to the Caribbean as punishment. Um, but you actually see that in the planters themselves wanted Scottish labour. They, they thought Scottish workers were the best suited to the Caribbean and they wanted and constantly pressured to get more Scots out there and failing that more English and Welsh people. Irish labour was actually at the bottom of their interest and on several occasions the planters essentially beg the imperial government to stop sending them Irish servants because they don't want them. <laughs> Well, I mean, of well, course, I mean, the, of course the, the, the Scottish the are, 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 much are much more suited, more suited to the Caribbean labour. Oh yeah, obviously. I, I, it's it's some strange belief that Scottish Protestants had this uniquely brilliant work ethic and character that meant they they do great on plantations and they'd be really obedient and lovely. I mean, given given recent developments in the UK, I'm not sure if anyone would still feel that way. But yeah, it's it's an interesting so, philosophy. So, I mean, this is an interesting question because, I mean, how really connected was, uh, you know, the, the average British person to the Caribbean uh, slave system? I mean, was this a system where people were going back and forth, you know, making some money and coming back? Or was this kind of, you know, as you mentioned, a lot of the plantation owners were kind of, you know, they were absentee owners. It was that more common that you'd have these kind of absentee owners than you'd have a very small kind of British population over there? I guess I'm just trying to kind of get a measure of how present uh, the actual slave trade was in Britain at the time, rather than just through, um, you know, the, the writings of, of abolitionists. It, it depends a lot on whereabouts in the UK you are. If you're in a city like Liverpool, you're going to be much, much more intimately connected to the slave trade because Liverpool is a, is a massive port. This type might be the, I think by this point, it is the biggest port in Britain. Um, and it, it's a favourite destination, you know, for the slave ships, for ships that are bringing goods back that, you know, they brought from the Caribbean where they've been harvested with slave goods, goods that are being bought and sold using profits made by um, the slave trade. In general, though, it's, it's not something that's going to be particularly present in the lives of the average British person. And even in the lives of the British elite, the, uh, there's, a, there's a group in Parliament called the West India Lobby who historians traditionally assumed had to be really quite huge and powerful because, you know, so many wealthy people are investing in slavery in the New World. But actually, recent research has shown that it's it's a group of about 30 to 40 MPs in a parliament of 650. Um, and, you know, in this day and age, if you're in parliament, you're, you're pretty well connected with the society's elite. Their influence came largely from the fact that these this very small minority of people knew so many other people rather than they were particularly well represented in the elite. And as I, as I said earlier, we know by the end of slavery, about half of all the planters in the Caribbean were absent, and probably a few more than that, actually, um, because even absentee planters will occasionally go back to the Caribbean and will have just happened to be there at the time when they were recorded as being in the Caribbean. Um, so it's, it's not something that was particularly present in the minds of most people until the abolitionist campaign comes along and starts making this an issue, and what they tend to really focus on is, you know, look, you're all going out and buying sugar and coffee and tobacco. These goods are made by slave labor. You're investing in slavery. So it's it's not dissimilar to what you see in the modern world when people campaign against, you know, supermarkets and shops that are uh, using goods made by sweatshop labor. It's a very similar phenomenon. It's connected in that way, but not in a way that a lot of people were thinking of consciously. So passing this 1807 Slave Trade Act, which were the, really the abolishment of the slave trade, um, and again, just to, to reiterate to everyone, this is not abolishing slavery. This is abolishing the slave trade. Um, yeah, it's so not abolishing we, slavery. Yeah, <laughs> although we will get around to that. Um, we will get around. So was that then kind of an easy vote? I mean, did it fly through the parliament or was there, you know, long drawn out, um, you know, people getting into fist fights on, you know, the parliament floor and pulling off each other's wigs or did it just kind of go through? Parliament has strict rules, actually, at this point in history, by uh, by what you can and cannot do to another member physically. So it's a it's a strange debate. Um, to this um, day, in days. Parliament, you have to sit two sword lengths apart 
from members of the opposing party so you don't stab them, which is one of my favourite laws in the world. But yeah, no, it's it's a weird period when you're talking about how popular is it, because generally speaking in this day and age, if a measure is going to pass the House of Commons, the, the opposition just don't bother turning up for it. So it's quite hard to assess how close a vote is. The final vote in the Commons is actually passed 283 to 16. Only 16 MPs bother to turn up to oppose it because they know it's going to pass Parliament. Um, but the reason for that is the year before, Parliament had already passed legislation that had banned involvement with the slave trade with France. And the various components of this bill had the practical effect of meaning that about half to two thirds of the slave trade was essentially wiped out overnight because British ships could now intercept ships that were carrying foreign flags as part of the war with France. So that really paves the way for allowing abolition. And when that bill was being passed, the abolitionists were able to say, hey, if you vote against this bill, you're in favour of helping France win this war with their having with us. So it was quite a, quite a clever um, tactic. But, um, but yeah, the actual passing of the bill itself ends up being quite uncontentious. And part of that is because the slave owners themselves actually realise abolishing the slave trade is inconvenient, but we can find a way to make this work. And the abolitionists don't basically click on that that's what's happening. Yeah, I, I suppose there's an idea that, you know, it's the slave trade itself that's getting all the bad press. So if we just get rid of the slave trade, we can we can hold on to slavery if we get rid of this one thing that's making, you know, our slave system that already exists look bad. Exactly. And this is happening around the same time as some planters in the Caribbean have started to wise up to the direction the debate's going in. And they've started trying to take measures to improve on paper the conditions of their slaves. Uh, we call these uh, amelioration measures. And these sort of come in from about the 1780s, 90s onwards, up until the early 18, very, very early 1800s. And that's very much part of a, a scheme to try and paint slavery in a positive light, because the first attempts at abolition of the trade happened in 1791. And that, that bill gets very comfortably rejected in Parliament. But it does spook the planters in the West Indies and makes them start trying to represent themselves in a much more positive light. Now, I want to loop back around a little bit because we've been talking a lot about British people, essentially, uh, and their practice of slavery and not much about the slaves themselves. So just to kind of go back a little bit, you know, where were all these millions of slaves coming to the Caribbean coming from? I mean, naturally, of course, you know, we, we are talking about African slaves, but Africa is a very large place. So, you know, do we have particular groups, particular areas that uh, are, you know, coming to the Caribbean? They're essentially the same origin points that you see going to the United States in the slave trade. It's mainly British ships who are ferrying slaves from Africa to North America in general in this period, unless you're going to a, a Spanish, French or Portuguese colony. It's various diverse groups in West Africa from quite a wide ranging um, border. I, I don't do West African history myself, so I'm not particularly hot on the specific kind of ethnic and religious groups that uh, make up the slave population. We do have someone on the sub who does know better, but I can't think of the name right now. Um, but yeah, the, these are people coming from West Africa from the same kind of origin points that people in the United States would be coming from, generally speaking. Some planters definitely do show preferences for slaves from certain parts of Africa, but generally they're not really that bothered. They, they'll take anyone from anywhere, effectively. And are they doing the, the stereotypical thing, as, as was done in the United States, of uh, breaking up people who were of common ethnic groups into splitting them up uh, in order to kind of prevent any uh, group coalition, I guess you could say? Uh, yeah, that's a pretty uniform practice across the New World of trying to make sure. I mean, part of that happens before they even arrive in the New World in terms of, you know, it's somewhat look of the draw what ship you end up on. People don't realize that very often someone who is bought or less commonly captured in West Africa will often be held on the coast for a few months before they actually make it to the New World, which is an interesting point because we don't actually have any idea how many people died in those kind of coastal facilities before they even made it onto a ship. But yeah, it's essentially the same with the same idea of making sure you don't have these groups forming with cohesive identities. What they really want is people forming an identity, uh, you know, the process of creolization where they come to see themselves as native to the Caribbean and especially as born slaves. 
Now, let's go back to the post-1807 area, post-1807 era. Uh, and particularly, I mean, you mentioned these amelioration measures. Were these kind of just things on paper, or was that, you know, actual attempts to ameliorate the, the conditions? Now, that is a very interesting question, and the answer is most probably that the measures largely existed on paper. They probably did result in some improvement for the slaves, but nothing particularly substantial. These are these are probably fundamentally a, a PR exercise. Um, I will note as an aside that this is actually my thesis, so I'm not going to say too much about this because I'm waiting to figure it out myself. But that aside, yeah, it's the consensus at the moment is they probably didn't achieve very much. And what we do see is in the 1820s, uh, the imperial government starts saying, come on, guys, you've got to start improving conditions for your slaves. These... The, the tide is turning against you. We want to help you here, but you've got to help us out. And Caribbean planters basically stick their middle finger up at that and say, no, we've done enough. We've done plenty. They love being slaves now. So in their minds, they were improving conditions, but we, we have no reason to believe there was any meaningful change from the pre-amelioration period. So, I mean, at this point, you, you know, you mentioned the 1820s. It, it sounds like maybe there was kind of from, you know, in that decade after uh, the, the Slave Trade Act that there may have been kind of some breathing room, I guess you would say, where the, the pressure for abolition was taken off. Yeah, there really is. Because, you know, again, the abolitionists themselves, they, they were expecting the slave trade to die out, slavery, sorry, to die out quite quickly after the abolition of the trade. Because, you know, they knew that this isn't like the United States. They need these imports of slaves. And to an extent, they are right. The slave population starts to go into decline. But essentially, they're buying into the same narrative a lot of people have today about the Caribbean, where it's a death camp and people are dying left, right and centre. And that's not the case. So their expectations of population decline are way and above what was actually going to happen. And as I say, in some places like Barbados, the, the slave population starts to organically reproduce itself. Um, so you have a kind of a, a period of a few years reprieve, especially where the British government is not interested in the question of direct abolition, uh, whereby the, the pressure does disappear a little bit. And it's it's really 1823 when the pressure starts to properly mount again. And in that year, you get the formation of what becomes the Anti-Slavery Society, what at the time was the Society for the Mitigation and Gradual Abolition of Slavery, um, which aimed instead to force gradual emancipation on the planters, and later comes to give way to a campaign for immediate emancipation. So essentially we have a decade of them saying, of, of abolitionists saying, okay, it'll, it'll fall apart by itself any day now. Any day now. Yeah, pretty much. Yeah. Um, and it doesn't. Yeah, it certainly doesn't. I mean, was there anything else that kind of really, I mean, aside from the decade that passed, was there anything else that really kind of um, made these these abolitionists in Britain realize that this, this system was not going away? Well, a, a big factor that can't be understood is, is this is a period of increasing liberalization in British politics. We are building up to the general election that will transform the history of Britain in which what becomes the Liberal Party will win a crushing landslide in Parliament, which we'll think we'll talk about a little bit later. But it's it's a period of increasing ideas about rights and about liberty and about freedom and justice. And this really influences the abolitionists in, th in thinking, well, you know, we need to we need to be firmer on this. We can't just sit around if it's going to take this long. We've got to stand up for these people as much as they saw them as people, because just like abolitionists in the United States, they weren't always the most um, equally minded of people, should we say. But also it, you do get, throughout the period, you get people going out to the Caribbean, abolitionists and anti-slavery activists, who go and investigate what's happening. And the reports they're bringing back of things are just as bad as they've always been really help to influence this push. You even get, there's, there's definitely one government official who goes out there in, I think, the 1810s or 1820s, and he wants to prove that slavery is fine and dandy and it's all going lovely since the abolition of the trade. And he comes back with his report and is like, well, I couldn't have been more wrong. Um, <laughs> so, you know, it's it's stuff like that. It's Nothing has particularly changed in the Caribbean. They're, they're doing what they've always done. It's just that in Britain, the pressure is mounting. 
So let's talk about this 1832 election then, and, and really more importantly, you know, what becomes of it? So what changes in 1832 and how does that manifest uh, in a way that is relevant to abolition in the, in the Caribbean? Well, through the 1820s, you've got these campaigns from 1823 onwards. They, they revive the big anti-slavery campaigns and start pushing. And something really important that happens in the 1830s is the British government is able to pass a series of massive electoral reforms. And we normally call this the Great Reform Act. They essentially, they broaden the franchise. They make it easier to qualify for voting by lowering property requirements. They reform the way district boundaries are drawn, because before 1832, you have a lot of what we call rotten boroughs, which are tiny, tiny constituencies that might have 10 voters in them. And they're electing the same number of representatives as a constituency with 5,000 voters in it. Um, and a lot of these seats tend to be held by the kind of people who are sympathetic to the slavery interest. Combined with those reforms, the abolitionist movement sees an opportunity in the broadening of the franchise and the redrawing of the boundaries, which I should also mention uh, brings representation from cities into play in a much bigger way for the first time in British history. But the abolitionists essentially go around and they lobby candidates running for parliament to say, will you oppose slavery? And because they've been out there with these great public campaigns, a lot of the new voters coming in are very sympathetic to anti-slavery sentiment. So... This confluence of factors means that in 1832, when the Whig Party, which is essentially the Liberal Party of the day, uh, wins what is still the biggest landslide in British history, a lot of their candidates, as such as you had a party candidate in that day and age, have campaigned to vote against slavery. Um, and a lot of the West Indian representatives have lost their seats to Liberal candidates. They get absolutely wiped out. No, you, you know, we've talked about, uh, you know, British abolitionists with this idea of, of being very religiously motivated, uh, as well as kind of this political and economic uh, idea of, you know, cutting the legs off, uh, you know, French slave trade and, and, uh, and, you know, doing it for more kind of just kind of practical reasons. But I mean, did you also have people who were coming back from uh, the Caribbean, uh, kind of as ex explanters, saying, you know, I, you know, giving kind of giving testimony to how horrible the system is? We talked about this, this one uh, MP who had come back with his report. But, you know, do we have people involved in that system coming to Britain, talking to abolitionists, whether they be ex-planters or even ex-slaves? The ex-slave uh, feature isn't nearly as big of a part of British abolitionism as it is um, North American abolition, abolitionism. The, the one big guy who's, who's no, whose first name I can never pronounce, but his surname is Equiano, very, very famous, writes what is one of the, the earliest slave narratives um, in the late 18th century. He essentially becomes a, a British celebrity in the campaign to abolish the slave trade. He, he gives lecture tours. He makes a fortune speaking against slavery, even to pro-slavery groups. Sometimes he goes around and has, has debates and challenges people. And he really uh, wows a lot of kind of normal people who, as normal as you get in this day and age in terms of a, a, an interested voter, um, with his eloquence and the brilliantness of his ideas and how as they would say, civilised he is. So you have Equiano as really the only standout example of an ex-slave who comes back. You do get ex-planters and ex-slave traders who also play a role. The guy who wrote Amazing Grace, and they made a, an awful film about him, he was a slave trader and he had a religious conversion experience and he later spent a large part of his life campaigning to abolish both the slave trade and slavery. But generally... The planter interest doesn't have many defectors who are saying, oh, I, I regret my ways. No, it was all horrible. What you do get, which is interesting, in both 1807 and in, in the 1830s, is a argument coming mainly from British people sympathetic to the planters, that actually abolishing the slave trade and then abolishing slavery is in their best interests because they will be forced to adopt free labour, which is more efficient and is better, and actually they will end up being richer as a result of it. Um, so you have that strange group who, are, who feel like they're arguing in the planters' best interests. The planters do not agree with them, but they're an interesting force in getting the legislation through Parliament because they are kind of the moderates in between who kind of end up crossing from one side to the other, as it were. So we have this 1832 election, 
the I guess you you know the the landed elite of of these plantation owners uh, see their at least, you know if not their because they never had a majority of course but at least their defenders and those people who would vote with them kind of swept out the door in favor of people who are much more strongly interested in uh, ending the system. And of course they do, correct? I believe it's it's the next year that abolition is officially passed. Yeah, 1833, the House of Commons and House of Lords both pass uh, a bill to effect the abolition of slavery. In the, only in the British Caribbean, though, I should stress. Uh, it, it's abolished 10 years later in India. But, uh, but in the British Caribbean, yeah, 1833, taking effect in 1834. So at that point, uh, slavery ends, and I guess that's the end of the podcast. So thanks, everyone, for listening in. There's nothing more to talk about. No. So what happens in the Caribbean then? I mean, are, are there are there plans on how to implement this? Um, is there something like uh, like a Freedmen's Bureau that gets planned to be set up? You know, how is how are they going to go about actually freeing these millions of people in the Caribbean? Well, the, the British Caribbean makes United States emancipation policy look positively enlightened. Um, it's it's an interesting one. They don't actually free the slaves immediately. They they very generously give them a one year period where they will continue to be slaves. And then the Act of Parliament specifies two dates for effecting the final end of slavery, 1838 for some slaves and 1840 for others. They immediately emancipate from 1834 all slaves under a certain age, which to memory is six. This applies to all colonies, by the way. This this is a British Act of Parliament. It applies to every Caribbean colony equally and at once. Yeah, they uh, emancipate children straight away. Then they create for everyone else a system we call apprenticeship, which is essentially a form of indentured servitude where they are required to continue working for their former owners for a period of four to six years, depending on what kind of work they were doing. Domestic slaves are supposed to work for another four years. Uh, Field slaves are supposed to work for another six years. And and so, I mean, I, I, I can kind of see where this is going, but how did that work out? Um, well, funny enough, there is a very good journal article about this called Slavery by Another Name, uh, and it's a pretty accurate representation. The planters essentially, from the get-go, from literally day one, I mean, they let them keep their slaves for a year, and the planters are spent, essentially spend that year trying to figure out how best to exploit this new system. So when it comes in, immediately the, the legislatures in the Caribbean are passing the most ridiculously restrictive laws to essentially keep them trapped on plantations even more so to allow ridiculous stance for discipline you get the emergence of because one of the provisions of this law is that you should have a, a more independent oversight of how discipline is administered so you get this system of what are essentially workhouses and poorhouses for unruly ex-slaves which it's it's essentially just a strange process where they they outsource torture to theoretically independent parties who just happen to be the planter's best friends. Um, and this, they, they devise all manner of new means of actually um, torturing and disciplining slaves that are quite horrific. You know, you, you have this one famous thing where in these workhouses you would get the treadmill, which is basically a massive wooden, I don't even know, water wheel effectively that slaves would be expected to run on for hours at a time, often whilst being whipped as a method of disciplining them. And this was actually partially okay with the British authorities who thought it was preparing slaves for freedom, that they were learning to be real people, which is just the most bizarre mentality. Um, And you do wonder if anyone actually thought that was going to work. But it's it's just it is slavery by another name, effectively. Well, I mean, was there any truly independent oversight of how the apprenticeship system was supposed to be rolled out? I mean, was, you know, were there members of parliament coming over to observe the process or sending representatives to make sure it was carried out the way they intended? Well, parliament reinstates a system that used to exist in the colonial period called the magistry. And the magistry is is based on a system in, in English law. Often in the UK, if you commit a very minor crime, you'll go and see a magistrate. And the magistrate will decide up to I, this very low penalty what will be done with you. So they essentially bring this system that exists in the early period back, whereby if you want to discipline a slave seriously, well, ex-slave in theory, uh, you have to go and see the local magistrate. And this magistrate will look, rep, look after both your interests. Now, these magistrates are 
white men who are going to be much more sympathetic to the planters. They have no bureaucracy to support them because the, the plant of establishment controls the legislatures in the Caribbean and they don't want to support them. And they send an absolutely stupidly low number of these magistrates out there. And in fact, one of them dies within three weeks of arriving in Jamaica and never gets replaced, immediately wiping out a significant portion of the system in Jamaica. And it's, it's woefully inadequate. And the, the British government is well aware of this. They just they just can't be able to fund it effectively. Yeah, they're like, we, you know, we've signed the bill. Everything should work out. I mean, how long does this emancipation system last? Because, you know, after four years, they're supposed to start uh, emancipating slaves. I mean, is there idea to, uh, you know, do they already have their own private plots? You know, because, you know, the, the idea usually of, of the slave system is usually that, you know, you work six days on the plantation, then you have one day to work your own plot. I mean, do they do they already have their own, like, small plots that they are going to basically be released to? Um, yeah, in theory, that's that's the intention in a way. Um, the Caribbean system has small plots from, from the outset because, generally speaking, slaves are expected to provide a much greater share of their own food than they would be in the United States. So the Caribbean has a long history of slaves having their own little gardens and, you know, mini farming estates, which, funny, some contemporaries misunderstand these and use these gardens of representations of how slaves had great lives because they had houses and they tend their own gardens and it's like it's a bit different to having your your gardener come around to do your flowers if you're growing food or you'll die but that's that's racist sentiment for you but no uh, that's in favor of plan what actually happens is that the planters spend apprenticeship also trying to figure out right once this system is abolished how do we continue exploiting these people even more without the legal framework and you get, once again, abolitionists going out to the Caribbean, looking what's happening and seeing that nothing is changing, often arguing that they think things have gotten worse because these people are now at least legally recognised as free and look at how they're being treated. And they really push the British government to say, you've got to do something. This system isn't working. That pressure actually pays off because in 1838, the British government says all those slaves who were meant to serve till 1840, you're free now as well because you are not being looked after like we thought you were going to be. And that is a genuine moral response on the part of the British government, at least to pressure from the electorate, if nothing else. So, I mean, at this point, we basically have general emancipation. Yeah, 1838, general emancipation is affected for all slaves, regardless of their, uh, their discipline. Now, do we see something as cropped up in the American South, where it's essentially, I mean, because you know, we talked about how horrible the apprenticeship system was, you know, but... Do we, I mean, do we see an improvement of that or do we essentially see slavery as another name continuing uh, through things like sharecropping? It, this varies quite a bit depending on the colony you're on. Um, Jamaica experiences something we call the flight from the estates, which is where pretty much as soon as slavery is abolished, the ex-slaves tell their masters where to go and flee the estates. And that's made possible by the fact that in colonies like Jamaica and a few other colonies, you have a lot of unused, abandoned or empty land that it is very easy to just go and squat on and no one's going to come and remove you. So in the colonies where there's an excess of land, they generally leave the estates in huge numbers in the years following emancipation rather than work for their former owners for what are often pitifully low wages. And they go and set up their own farming estates. Um, that doesn't work out in places like Barbados, where the planter establishment basically already owned every bit of land there was and could realistically remove you if you were squatting. In Barbados, we see they use a system of rent control effectively to try and re-indenture, as it were, the slaves by saying, well, you want to keep your little plot of land, but it's on my land, so you're going to have to pay me rent. And I don't think you can afford the rent, but I'll tell you what. If you work for me for next to nothing, I'll let you keep your land because I'm generous like that. So that is essentially a, a similar system to sharecropping. But sharecropping itself doesn't really develop in the uh, in the British Caribbean. That's very much an American and South African phenomenon. There was also the issue of essentially the, the British government repaying the planters for their, their lost slaves who were, as we're seeing, mostly not lost. Yeah, um, they... Um, they condition of emancipation in the original legislation is that Parliament will set aside a sum of money 
to pay the planters for the loss of property, the human property. Um, so it's it's a bit like the Emancipation Proclamation in that the the act of abolition affirms the legal and moral reality that these people were seen and held as property. It doesn't undermine that in any way. In the end, the sum of compensation they're promised is £20 million, which doesn't sound like a lot in the scheme of government spending today, but at the time, it's a, it's a massive, massive burden on Britain's public finances. They spend a fortune compensating these planters, and even then, they only get a tiny fraction of the value they had invested in their slaves back, really. And that's a process that essentially works by they, they have a, a census, essentially, of slaves and slave owners, and they evaluate the average price in each colony and they give people who apply a percentage of the value they were entitled to as compensation for loss of property. So, I mean, it sounds like, you know, I hate to say it, but it sounds like emancipation actually kind of worked out for the for the plantation owners. They They primarily still have their former slaves working for them for next to nothing. They've gotten, you know, if if not all of the money they've invested in uh, buying human property, they've at least gotten their, I hate to use the word, but reparations uh, for the loss of that property. Um, you know, what what changed? I mean, you know, it sounds like this system would just keep humming along with no interruption. Well, it, this is again where the individual colonies vary in importing ways because Jamaica actually suffers quite badly. Sugar, Jamaica's not a sugar colony in the same way the others are but half of its production is in sugar, effectively. But in Jamaica, because so many slaves leave the estates, about half of all slaves and about two-thirds of all female slaves flee the estates and choose not to work for wages. Many of the slaves who do stay behind choose to work on their own terms and say, well, I don't actually need that much money. I'm only going to work for you for three or four days, not six days, sorry. So... The plantation establishment actually suffers quite badly in this period, except in places like Barbados, where they have that means of retaining a very high degree of control. And we see left, right and centre very quickly, plantations start to close down. And part of that is because they spent so much time trying to figure out a way to keep their slaves as long as possible. They didn't bother to invest anything in modernisation, in farming equipment, in animals, in food production. Um, because this is something else. They were, they were accustomed to slaves having to grow food as well. I mean, Barbados essentially sees its domestic non-commercial agricultural industry obliterated by the transition to freedom. So they now have to pay costs to import food, whereas before they were selling it to other colonies. Um, so actually, at first it seems like it's all working out for planters, but in the long run it doesn't. And that gets compounded by the fact that the British government's experience with them has really soured them on the planters. They're sick of their resistance and they're trying to get their own way. And at the same time, Britain now has alternative sources of sugar coming in from other parts of the world. And they start to remove the preference they gave in trade to those colonies. And that really, really hurts the sugar industry and brings down a lot of these plantations. So one thing I want to ask about that we've kind of, uh, we haven't really touched upon is that you know, did any of these planters, did, did any of this planter class just decide to, you know, before uh, emancipation or before even uh, the apprenticeship system, you know, did they see the writing on the wall and just pack up and leave to places where slavery is still legal, whether it be uh, the United States or uh, to Brazil? Not not particularly, no. I mean, I'm sure there were, there were some planters who probably did, but generally speaking, these are not people who are particularly invested, by and large, in those states. Again, half of them don't even live in the Caribbean. The ones that do, a lot of them end up just coming back to Britain. A lot of them, you know, it's it's a very different environment to the United States. You can't very easily just sell off all of your slaves in your estate. You've got to find someone who's willing to give you money for that as a package, effectively, who's willing to buy you out. You can't just sell half your slaves off and then go off to the states. That's just not practical especially because the slave trade is now illegal. You can't very easily ferry all of your slaves over to the United States because both your government and their government are opposed to you doing that. So I'm sure one or two individuals did, but you know, even in the US we see very, very few people move south to Brazil from the Confederacy, and most of those who do end up coming back. So no, that's, that's not really a phenomenon. They either stay in the Caribbean or they end up coming back to Britain and just cutting their losses. <laughs> 
Now, I, I want to work us towards an epilogue here, but I, I just want to kind of ask two questions or really kind of uh, say, ask you about two things that I've, I've always heard about the end of, uh, about Britain ending its slave trade and its slave system, uh, particularly in the Caribbean. And the first is that, and we touched a little bit about this when we talked about uh, talking about how, how Britain said that ending the slave trade would hurt France, who it was war with. But part of the reason that Britain was okay with ending the slave trade, as, as I've heard, is that they had essentially set up mature slave colonies and they didn't really need to continue the slave trade. You know, they had the slaves that they needed, so they were just turning off the spigot for everyone else. You know, once they had gotten what they wanted out of the slave trade, they could turn it off, not so much as like this grand moral idea, but this idea of like, well, we've gotten what we want, now no one else can have it. Well, it's it's partially true, I guess, in the sense that, you know, we, we do see that actually slavery continues on struggling, but just fine in the, with the abolition of the slave trade. And there were, there were absolutely people who were aware of that and who thought that, as I said earlier, abolishing the slave trade may have even been an economic advantage because it would encourage planters to see ways of, of treating their slaves better and maximizing their efficiency and so on. So there's, there's an element of that, definitely, and we, we shouldn't overstate the morality of the role. Certainly the abolitionist lobbying for slavery were, were very considered, but the, the imperial government was not about to affect abolition if they thought it was going to significantly harm either the treasury at home or the security and stability of their colonies, certainly. Right now, there's a very significant South Asian population in the Caribbean, uh, particularly if we look at places like, you know, Trinidad. One of the things that I've heard is that, well, you know, of course, Britain was OK with abolishing uh, slavery, you know, having emancipation because they could meet their labor needs in the Caribbean just by, you know, bringing over these uh, <laughs> bringing over people from India to the West Indies. That's that's a pretty bad case of putting the cart so far in front of the horse, the horse can't even see the cart. Um, it's it's not the case in that way. Um, the use of Indian indenture is is a huge thing in the Caribbean, especially in Trinidad, as you say. But I think now there are more people of Indian descent than there are non-mixed race people of African descent in Trinidad, which is how big Trinidad is on importing Indian labour. But this comes after emancipation and after apprenticeship especially. It's one of the solutions for planters come up with as a means of trying to deal with the problem of abolition. But it's not actually necessarily about finding a replacement labour force all the time. One of the things they really think is, well, if we bring in all of these Indian workers who, who have to work for us for indenture, uh, all of these African Caribbean workers, they're going to have to accept lower wages because they're now competing. Uh, it's, it's a very strange way in which the, the ex-slave owning establishment embraces the free market economics that partly helped promote abolition in Britain. And that, that does work. It does serve to depreciate wages, but not by nearly enough. And actually, from the perspective of the, the British government, Indian indenture and Chinese indenture is also used, um, not very successfully at all. Um, it's really a very unpopular policy because it causes enormous tension between the Indian authorities and the Caribbean authorities because the Indian authorities see themselves as having to constantly clean up this mess of unrest being caused by people disappearing out to the Caribbean and leaving behind families and being trapped in exploitative relations. Abolitionists at home are saying, look what you're doing, you're just bringing back the slave trade. Um, so it's it's not anyone's preference, and it's certainly not the case that they sat down and thought, oh, we'll get rid of slavery and we can we can use Indian indenture instead. It's, a, it's something they come to think afterwards. And there's, there's even a very brief experiment with using European labour again that just does not work out at all. Um, and that, that's just before Indian indenture really kept, takes off. So to bring us to sort of an epilogue, I want to ask, uh, well, we had, we had talked a little bit about how there's a bias in the sources, how, you know, some of the sources we have kind of, you know, they're from these three major areas, uh, which kind of over override everything else we might have. So I, I guess, you know, what is the state of scholarship uh, of uh, British Caribbean slavery? Um, in, in part, on the academic side, um, this is kind of part one of this question. On the academic side, you know, what are the new avenues and areas that are going into looking into the, uh, this this period? 
And on the second part of this question, you know, what is kind of the public understanding in Britain of this period, of, of their own British history and involvement with slavery? So let's let's take part one first, shall we? Okay. Um, on the academic side, there's, there's it's a little bit of a mixed bag, but there is absolutely a thriving scholarly community dedicated to British Caribbean history and to British Caribbean slavery. Um, but it is a quite small, quite contained community. There aren't nearly as many people working on British Caribbean slavery as there are working on slavery in the United States. Very often, the British Caribbean is treated as a, not a footnote, but as, as an ancillary story to what's happening in the United States. So, for example, there's a, there's a book out recently called Amelioration and Empire, which is a brilliant book, and it's supposed to be talking about the phenomenon of amelioration across the New World in um, in imperial context, and it has loads on the United States, and then there's just this one chapter on the British Caribbean, and it's all about one guy and what he thought, and that's it. That That's basically the extent of its treatment. That's quite a common phenomenon, and there are, there are a few Caribbean specialists running around dealing with just slavery. A lot of the time, Caribbean historians look at Caribbean history more broadly and um, I mean and to be fair I, I've done research on the Caribbean that's been in the 1940s so I'm, I'm part of that problem a little bit in some ways but academically it, it, it's going well but it's a mixed bag and it's, it's a much slower slog getting the scholarship up to date and refined than it is in United States slavery definitely and that's that's partly the nature of the fact that you know there are very comparatively few scholars coming out of the Caribbean and people tend to study the context that they themselves are familiar with most historians of American slavery are American. With popular perceptions in, in Britain, certainly, our narrative tends to stop at 1807. It tends to stop with the abolition of the slave trade. And it's very much painted, certainly in schooling, as there were a few bad eggs doing bad things in the Caribbean, but it's all right, we caught on to them, and in 1807 we made them stop it. Oh, and slavery kind of carried on for a few years but don't worry we got rid of that too no one ever talks about apprenticeship no one ever talks about the struggle to abolish slavery versus the slave trade in the same detail it's always focused on that great narrative of oh the moral british making this wonderful self-sacrifice and abolishing the slave trade for the sake of humanity and um, you know we don't we don't really go much past that very rarely do we at least before university education uh, even if you look at popular websites on the topic, they, they normally stop in 1807, pretty much. The other thing I want to ask about is to return to the Caribbean, because, you know, these these former slave colonies now are themselves, you know, independent nations, uh, primarily, you might say, uh, run by those former slaves. So, I mean, how is this period of, of slavery, you know, how does that factor into their, their national ideas and how they look upon themselves? It's, it's interesting you should ask, actually, because there's, there's just been a um, general election in Jamaica. And one of the issues some people were talking about vis-a-vis the governing party was that they accepted this contract from Britain to, uh, to have Britain fund so many new prisons because Jamaica does have quite a problem with crime. And they did lobby for reparations, effectively, for some slavery a little bit, but they've always been, they were, they were too shy and too timid in taking the issue to the British government. And this, this issue of reparations is quite a, a hot one amongst the Caribbean elite. There was a meeting of heads of government in the 80s or 90s in the Caribbean where they, they met with a quite prominent Caribbean historian who essentially told them that, you know, for the last 40 years, you haven't been running countries, you've been cleaning up Britain's mess. And I think a lot of people in the British Caribbean are definitely, quite rightly, sympathetic to the idea that slavery has marred them in such a way that it's really distorted their prosperity and opportunities beyond belief really i mean the caribbean is is quite outstanding that these these are thriving democracies jamaica has one of the most representative parliaments in the world in terms of the number of people who vote for a member of parliament you know your mp can be really really accessible on paper but its economy is in such a bad state, and that is because of the legacy of slavery. Britain didn't consider seriously investing in the ex-slaves and their well-being until about the 1890s. It's only then they start thinking, actually, maybe the white guys aren't 
always the best people to support in these colonies. Maybe we should support the you know the normal African Jamaican population, and that's true of most colonies in the Caribbean. So slavery has has really profoundly marked the legacy of Caribbean politics, Caribbean economy, and people are acutely aware of that. And there is a big demand in the Caribbean for Britain to do something to try and make up for that today, um, which is a very interesting debate. Probably, just as a final way of example, Bermuda is probably the place where this has been most obvious. Uh, Bermudan politics for decades was dominated by a, a white political party until breaking the 20-year rule here, forgive me, uh, until 1998, when um, a party that represents mainly the descendants of ex African slaves finally won power and they their politics has always been completely focused on this tension between ex slave owner and ex slave in a in a really fascinating way and in a much more strongly distilled way than even in the United States. Well, Souser, I want to thank you so much for speaking to us on the Ask Historians podcast. Thank you for having me. And as always, thank you so much for listening, and thanks to all our Patreon patrons who support the podcast and, and keep this uh, up and running and alive. I, I did say that we would talk about a book giveaway at the end of the episode, and here we are at the end of the episode. So let's talk about that. So uh, I've put up a new funding goal. So at $45 a month, uh, I think we will have um, sufficient kind of overlay of our basic operating costs, uh, our uh, Libsyn and our SoundCloud uh, you know, Pro account, uh, where we can put everything up there. So at uh, 45 we'll have addition additional uh, bonus funding, I guess you could say, to start giving you stuff. Uh, about every four months, uh, we will pick out a selection of books, and I say we will be myself, and also turn to uh, the panel of flares that we have on Ask Historians, uh, who I know will have some suggestions about this. Uh, we'll pick out um, a history book under $40. This would be academic texts, uh, really, uh, because we're snooty like that. Um, academic texts can be kind of expensive and i really do want to be able to support the authors of those books by buying new text not second uh you know not used text off the secondary market which you know might not contribute to their book sales so um it that contributes to the price uh, but hopefully we can find a great selection of books under 40 so about every four months we can start giving away books like that um if we do keep <laughs> if we do start exceeding that funding goal we'll do it more frequently uh or or uh and or uh, pick out even more expensive text. Ideally, I'd like to be giving away like you know first edition vintage primary sources to every month to people. But uh, maybe in the future we can we can swing that. But so uh, what we'll do again, uh, just to sum up after all my rambling, is that once we hit uh, forty five a month in our Patreon uh, account from all you wonderful people, uh, every four months uh, we will pick out a selection of books. Uh, we will take a name of all of our subscribers, and you can get uh, your name into this raffle for as, as little as $1 a month. Um, if you give $5, your name goes in twice. Uh, if you give $10, your name goes in three times. You big money bags you. So we'll do that. Uh, I'll pick out uh, a name, and then I will contact whoever that uh, subscriber is and ask them which of those books they would like shipped to them. So uh, that'll be great. And again, if we, if we start... If I start finding that we can get great books for even cheaper, then we'll do this more frequently. Uh, or if you know people start unleashing, unleashing the torrents of uh, support in the pecuniary sense, we will do this more frequently and uh, pick out you know more fancier books as well. So uh, I hope you're as excited about this as I am. Uh, so uh, again, the best way to get involved in this is go to patreon.com forward slash askhistorians. In the meantime, let's talk a little bit about the episode we just heard. So as you may have noticed at the beginning, uh, when talking with uh, Salzer, I made a lot of comparisons to the United States and you know pre-United States America form of slavery, uh, and that and that slave system, and that was kind of our touch point throughout. That we we came back to it uh, a couple times as well, and that's because a lot of people do know about that system very well. Uh, that is partially because the audience for Ask Historians is primarily or at least majority american uh, although we do have a very strong contingent around the world uh, surprisingly particularly people we've got a lot of germans and a lot of kiwis just kind of disproportionately so um guten tag and however you say hello in kiwi but also because america does have this kind of outsized influence on the world people tend to know about american history a lot better than they do say the history of jamaica or the history of saint kitts and nevis uh, which I don't think I could find on the map. My apologies to uh, 
Kittians and Navishans. But of course, part of the reason that we do this podcast is to kind of shed light on these lesser known parts of history and kind of show how they fit into the rest of the world and fit into your own mental schema of how history works. So I hope you got from this episode uh, a kind of a handhold on what was happening in this region at this time. And also not just what was happening in this region at the time, but as we talked about what was happening back in England at the time as well, the movements there, uh, particularly this 1832 uh, parliamentary election, which kind of really set up the modern British political system in the sense of, uh, at least in, in the terms of the electorate. And also just consider that as much as a huge effect that slavery has had on the United States, you know, in the Caribbean, we're looking at nations which are, in a large sense, kind of, if not the majority population, at least a very substantial part of that population are people who are descendants of slaves, of people who were brought there against their will, who are now, <laughs> you know, living in this area and that would has now become their home. So it's interesting. Uh, the Caribbean itself is, is uh, an interesting topic in general that I think is one of those areas that people kind of zoom right over even though it is this it's an it's an area where all of the you know the great powers of the colonial era were really interacting in a way that's is very very interesting so hopefully we'll be able to do some more uh, caribbean history uh, in, in the future but until then uh coming up on the next episode in two weeks we will be going to the other side of the world uh, almost literally and a few several centuries in the past as well uh, and we were talking to chris stewart of the history of china podcast about the three kingdoms period specifically what we're going to do because that period is hugely confusing uh and tumultuous although not quite as tumultuous as the period that came after it but we will be focusing in on just one of the three kingdoms and that'll be the kingdom of Wei. so we'll look at Wei from start to finish uh we'll talk about the three kingdoms period in general and also uh you know why more people don't know about chinese history and then two weeks after that in the uh next episode we will talk uh, to Ephricates about the Battle of Nemea as we zoom back over to classical Greece. Uh, and the Battle of Nemea was this 4th century BC battle, which was the largest hoplite battle on record. So we'll talk a lot about hoplite warfare, Greek warfare, some of the myths and misconceptions of it before finally turning ourselves to the battle itself and how it went and its significance. So I uh, hope to see you for both those episodes and all episodes in the future. Uh, if you like the show, please rate and review us on iTunes, particularly if you leave a written review. I believe that somehow works some sort of black magic, which uh, bumps us up into the ranks of suggested podcasts. So if you want to talk to more people about you know British Caribbean slavery or uh, the Three Kingdoms period or any of the other topics that we've covered on the show, you can do it with people who know exactly what you're talking about and you can build a firm community of, of history nerds and history aficionados alike. If you listen to us on any other service that allows rating and reviewing, please do so there. Uh, we always appreciate that. And I'm, I'm, I have no doubt that it also helps uh, bump up ratings and show other people just that this is a quality podcast. Uh, I've made some strides in the past few episodes to really kind of solidify our sound quality. So I hope you're appreciating uh, the effort that I've been putting into to that. I know I've uh, I, I've been very proud of it, but I know it's a subtle thing uh, for those of you who are not audiophiles. And for those of you who are audiophiles, you are notoriously hard to please. And you know this. Okay? Let's not pretend that you're easy to please. So, in two weeks, hope to see you back. Uh, until then, rate and review anywhere you go. And uh, thank you all for uh, your support of the podcast. You've been listening to the Ask Historians podcast. For more history like this, visit us at reddit.com slash r slash askhistorians and ask over a hundred historians and enthusiasts anything you want to know in history. Find us on Twitter as at AskHistorians, and subscribe to the show on iTunes. Or visit askhistorians.libsyn.com. Thank you very much for listening, and join us next time on the Ask Historians podcast.